All right, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to this Community Near Fault Observatory breakout session on subsurface fault zone structure. I am Casey Adderhold, Project Associate at Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology. IRIS is committed to the fostering exchange of scientific ideas by providing a safe, productive, and welcoming environment. All participants are expected to abide by the IRIS meeting code of conduct. Geophysical data collected within rupture zones of significant earthquakes are essential for testing and developing further models of earthquake processes. Focusing on in situ observations in the immediate vicinity of fault zones where rocks suffer permanent deformation during faulting events could transform the understanding of earthquake physics, improve ground motion prediction estimates, and contribute to structural engineering efforts to mitigate earthquake impacts. This breakout session is one in a series of sessions intended to gather input from the broader earthquake science community on key research areas, science questions, and the data and experiments needed to address them in the near fault zone. This breakout session will be recorded and archived on the IRIS Earthquake Science Presentations YouTube channel, and the discussion held here today will inform future sessions, workshops, and proposals. Should you have a comment or question as the session unfolds, then please clearly and concisely type it into the chat box on your Zoom control panel. If you would like to ask a question or make a comment, you can also raise your hand and we'll call on you in order. At the appropriate times, we'll read your name and question to the presenters. If similar questions have been asked, we may combine or skip them. If the session happens to crash due to Zoom or internet issues, we will reboot it. Just click the Zoom link again. Automatic captions are available to be turned off on and off on your Zoom control panel. To get an idea of the group we have with us today, I'm going to launch a quick poll. Please select your career stage and type of institution you're currently employed or enrolled in, as well as your prior familiarity and interest in the community near fault observatory. The poll will remain open and we can share the results at the end of the session. I'm going to pass this now to Frank Vernon to present an introduction and moderate the rest of the session. So Frank Vernon from um, UCSD, I will stop sharing. You can go ahead and share your screen now. Thank you very much, Casey. We will get started here. So as we discussed, um, as Casey brought forward, we're going to talk about the subsurface fault zone structure today. Um, a little bit of a background review. We have a map here of the kind of a notional layout of the faults on the left here with the uh, faults uh, when the last time they broke and then different colors. We have a notional uh, array here, which we can talk about more later in this particular session. And we have an example of a um, fault zone st structure, near, near fault structure taken from uh, Lake Quinn et al. Uh, from a paper on the San Jacinto Fault Zone in 2021. Uh, the scientific question that we're trying to look at today is like, what do we see when we look into the fault zones, the velocity structures, wave propagation properties, seismicity distributions, and what are the implications of these products and the temporal uh, variability of these signals? Uh, how would we observe these using a purpose-built observatory and what do we need in the observatory? To think about in the context of these questions, we wanna think about the signals that inform us about these science questions. And this is, spans all aspects of uh, geological and geophysical uh, observations and the properties of the observatories that are required to observe these signals. And then the, and another critical thing is like, this is a opportunity to start building the next generation uh, of, of observatory scientists, scientists. So how do we build the training and of, of people into this type of uh, project? Oops, wanna go down, not up. So just one last, uh, one piece of context here. Um, this fault zone observatory is not being built in a vacuum. There's already 400 and something broadband seismometers and over a thousand accelerometers in Southern California. A similar numbers of you know, there's hundreds of geodetic sensors in here, um, but we have very few stations within one kilometer of the main fault traces. And that's why we're focusing the rough so uh, design characteristics so far. Uh, the lack of these stations is uh, within fault zones is actually a global uh, phenomenon. So we would like to launch a uh, kind of a project to go even further that this kind of template could be put into other places. And then so, but it's very important to consider that the rough so will be leveraging the existing data sets 
and complementing the existing data sets to build a stronger observing system to give us better understanding of the earthquake fault structure as well as the earthquake rupture and the fault and the faulting properties. The speakers today will be a, a kind of nominal 30 minutes total. Uh, Elizabeth Cochran will be our first speaker talking about illuminating fault structure and properties using seismology. Ellis Favara will talk about constraints on the shallow uh, geometry of the Southern San Andreas Fault from seismic and geodetic observations. And Nate Oderdonk will talk about earthquake geology and paleo seismology considerations for UFSO. Uh, we will have a kind of 45, 50 minutes of feedback and discussion. And say, as Casey uh, mentioned earlier, uh, please raise your hand or submit via the chat tool and uh, enter comments in the Google Doc, in the, uh, Google Doc, which will be entered in the chat. And at that, I think I will hand over to uh, Peter Schar to uh, lead the session. Thank you. Thanks, Frank, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. So I'm, I'm Peter Shea. I'm an assistant professor at Oregon State University. And as Frank just uh, highlighted, we have this nice sort of um, order in which the presenter will come in. So we'll start a little bit deeper with Elizabeth, and we'll go shallower to the upper crust with Ellis, and then end with uh, some very near-surface observations of fault behavior and complexity right at the surface um, by Nate. And so let's start with Elizabeth Cochran. She comes to us from the um, US Geological Survey. She's an observational seismologist. Uh, a large branch of her research focuses on using spatiotemporal patterns and seismicity and how those inform fault complexities on different scales, different levels, uh, water content, et cetera, et cetera. And so Elizabeth, yeah, you're sharing already. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks so much for the opportunity to, to chat with you all today. So um, hopefully some of you did not see my SCEC talk because this will be an abbreviated <laughs> version of that. Uh, if not, you can go get a coffee for 10 minutes. All right. So um, I'm going to be talking about some ways that we can collect information about faults using seismology. So some of the things that we generally want to know in um, in understanding how and why and when faults rupture are things like stressing rate, uh, geometry, roughness, friction, um, and time evolution of all of these properties. So I'm gonna um, go through some recent studies that we have looking at uh, catalogs, de very detailed catalogs of earthquakes um, and seeing what we can figure out about what's happening along those faults. And this is relevant for, uh, for the Community Near, Near Fault Observatory because, you know, in the intervening years while we're waiting for a large earthquake, we will hopefully be collecting lots and lots of data on small events. And so that's what I'm going to be showing today. All right, so I'm going to take us first to uh, Kansas, where we um, were looking at injection-induced seismicity. This provided a really nice opportunity to record lots and lots of earthquakes. So we are starting in, um, as I said, in Southern Kansas, this is uh, at the very bottom portion of the state. Um, we did a template matching on, on um, events in this area and ended up with a catalog of 100,000 earthquakes. And so with that many events, we can do a lot to look at sort of the spatial temporal evolution. All right, so what I'm showing here is a, a map of this uh, region in southern Kansas. And the red background is just the um, total volume injected into kind of grid squares. And so you can see the injection is mostly down here in the southwestern portion of the study area. So as I mentioned, we did template matching. Uh, we found you know, lots of cases where we had few matches to a template, but we had a number of cases where we had um, over a hundred events matching to one of our template events. And this is over a five year period. So I've outlined these, what are called prolific families. So these are near repeating events um, and in blue here. And essentially what you can see already is that there's a very clear spatial distribution to these events. So we have lots of them located just to the north of the main um, injection area, and then a few scattered across the rest of the study area. 
So we did a very simple, uh, took a very simple look at these uh, earthquakes in order to look at basically their temporal evolution. So we're kind of leaving out space because we're going to be looking on a family by family basis and all those earthquakes are located essentially in the same place. There are two large events. The largest event is this magnitude 4.9 Mylon earthquake. And uh, the second largest is a magnitude 4.6 Harper earthquake. So we're just simply going to define clustering behavior. Here we're using uh, Kagan and Jackson, but there are multiple similar metrics for defining earthquake clustering in time. This is a really simple metric. It's just looking at the time between successive events, taking the standard deviation of those uh, inner event times, and then dividing by the average. And what we can do is then interpret these in terms of uh, whether the earthquakes are occurring exactly periodic, which we would mean this value is zero. If they're kind of independent background events that are caused by st steady forcing, but the earthquakes themselves are not really interacting with each other, that gives you a value around one. So this is Poissonian distributed. And then higher values of this coefficient of variation uh, indicate clustering. So we looked at the, um, at these prolific families and you can immediately see, so these are colored now by this coefficient of variation of inner event time. Green values are cases where we have these earthquakes happening fairly regularly in time. So not periodic, but sort of Poissonian distributed, really driven probably by the, directly by the pore pressure changes from injection. And then as we go farther away from the injection wells, you see we only see sequences that are main shock, aftershock clustering. Uh, so these are indicating that we're maybe getting the first event that's being triggered by poor pressure changes or other stress changes due to injection. And then that sets up essentially a main shock, aftershock sequence. Um, so uh, just the clustering behavior alone can tell us about sort of what the stressing rates are, what uh, and probably what the conditions on the fault are as well. So there's still more, more work needed to really understand why we get these very different uh, behaviors. But again, this is one thing we can see from just looking at temporal clustering. All right, so we're going to move on now to quickly look at the northern San Andreas Fault. So we're looking at a section of the San Andreas Fault from Loma Prieta down to Shalam. And again, we're just going to be looking, in this case, we're going to be looking at sort of the spatial temporal um, clustering of seismicity here. And of course, we're all familiar with the San Andreas Fault, which has variable fault coupling, um, where we have very much sort of thick slip behavior up to the north and then south along the Fort Tejon section with a creeping section uh, in the middle. So we know this from geodetic data, but we were interested in whether we can tell this with seismic data. And so what we looked at here was the, uh, again, the clustering of events. And essentially, if you have these independent Poissonian type distributed events, you're in a section where uh, the creep rate is highest. So suggesting that you have um, more aseismic behavior, perhaps lower coupling. And then when you have lots of clustering, uh, we're looking at, at an area where uh, the fault is um, behaving in, in a much more sort of seismic dominated uh, place. And if we just look at, this is just showing the distribution of events through time across this section of the fault, you can see that you know the the um, earthquake rates vary quite a bit across this section, and you couldn't if you just mapped earthquake rates alone, um, you wouldn't really see much of a correlation. Uh, we do see some slight correlation also with the B value. Um, so this is you know giving us a nice picture of the fault. The nice thing about this is uh, with using seismicity is we might have the potential of actually mapping this in depth, which is more difficult to do um, with just the geodetic data. So we did not do that here in, along this section of San Andreas Fault, but with sufficient data, it might be again possible to really kind of map out the different behaviors along strike as well as with depth. 
All right, and then the last section is we're moving now down uh, into Southern California here. So we're in a location between the San Jacinto and Elsinore Fault. This is uh, in an area near Cahuila. And this is a, the, what we call the Cahuila Swarm, which was a swarm of earthquakes that occurred over a four year time period from 2016 to 2019. So this is a map view of it. It's located at a depth of four to eight kilometers. Um, and just from this map view, you can already tell that we are able to actually delineate the fault structure just using seismicity. Um, the largest event that happened was a magnitude 4.4, which is uh, shown, we sort of outlined it here with this, uh, the, the assumed rupture area with this oval that's really using the earthquakes uh, in the day following the magnitude 4.4. So we've seen, you know, there are lots of studies that, that look at fault roughness at the surface using either surface traces or even fault surfaces from normal faults, um, imaging them with LIDAR and other techniques. But we really haven't been able to image fault roughness at depth. So these, um, this sequence actually provides us with a nice uh, view of the fault plane. So this is just looking at event density across this four kilometer by four kilometer fault that's illuminated by the swarm. Uh, so you can see there's kind of a, a large number of events that's, that uh, go up dip from this assumed natural injection point. This is showing the migration of the sequence in blue is where the earthquakes start. And basically over a period of um, almost two and a half years, it fills in this whole fault plane, gets stuck at a barrier, and then the events eventually migrate up past the barrier. And that's when we get the magnitude 4.4 and rupture across this, um, or not rupture, uh, rapid migration across this up to section. Um, so we can actually take profiles across the seismicity um, along this fault. So this is a long dip and a long strike. So in this profile, you can see a lot of the typical stru structures we see in faults, some branching, um, some stepovers in here, nice bend up here. So this is in that up dip section where that magnitude 4.4 happens. Uh, and these are colored by what we define as 2D roughness. This is a simple uh, looking at the residuals to a, a profile fit to this or a line fit to the, each profile. So yellow colors indicate higher roughness, blue colors lower roughness, and just comparing a long dip versus a long strike, you can see a long strike, we have much smoother profiles. And in fact, it's about 50%. Um, sorry, the, uh, the fault is about 50% rougher along dip compared to a long strike. We can all the, also do this mapping in 3D. So this is using, um, over here, we're looking for each earthquake, we take a, a 250 meter radius around that earthquake, fit a plane to those points, and then measure the residual again. And so that uh, gives us sort of a mapping of, of the roughness in 3D. And you can see, there are sections of the fault that are semi elongated along strike that are relatively smooth and others that are rougher. We see the highest roughness right near where our magnitude 4.4 rupture is. And we can also look at things like B value and see if there's correlations here. So maybe if you squint, you can see similar patterns between the roughness and the B value, except in their area of that largest event. Um, and this has actually been predicted predicted by uh, laboratory studies, which uh, suggest that you can get, you tend to have a low, sorry, a higher B value when you have higher roughness because the, there's a lot more sort of variation along your, your fault surface, which tends to give you more smaller events. Um, and I'm gonna run through this super quickly. This is just showing the um, distribution of B value and roughness before the magnitude 4.4 in blue here and after in red. And these values here are related to, are located essentially in the area of the 4.4. So we're seeing very different um, B value roughness relationships in that region. And so I will essentially leave you with some opportunities. So again, as I mentioned really briefly at the beginning, 
uh, dense grids of seismic instrumentation would let us to record really high resolution seismicity, which we could then use to do these detailed studies of clustering fault coupling. Um, and again, these what I've shown here is a very simple uh, analyses, and that can obviously be extended using focal mechanisms, stress drops, et cetera, um, if we have uh, the sufficient data um, around these, these earthquake locations. So I will stop there. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. That's um, fascinating stuff. Um, the, the studies on spatial temporal analysis of seismicity patterns have really gone to a much, much higher level, and it's super impressive. Um, we do have time for, for one question before we move to the next speaker. And if somebody wants to put up their hand for a question, that's fine. If you want to put in the chat, that's totally okay too. Um, but just let us know. If, if not, we'll, we'll move on. And I'll give it a few seconds. And yeah, and as, as Elizabeth showed, we... We don't only need to be worried now about the major fault strands, but ones in between them as well <laughs> in that last study in Southern California. Okay, it seems like we, we should move on. Um, so the next speaker is Ellis Favra. He's from, uh, he's a PhD student at UCSD. So he joins us from the, um, the early career community. We're super ha happy to have him. Um, he works with Yuri Fialco, and he's going to present now on a target that's relatively aseismic, and he's going to show us some unique tools in the fields of seismology and geodesy um, on how to inform that structure a little bit better. So go ahead, Ellis, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, all right. Uh, well, thanks uh, very much for the introduction, Peter. Um, uh, like you mentioned, uh, I'm a graduate student at uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Um, and I'll be discussing uh, results um, and ongoing work from a joint seismogeodetic study of the, in particular, the shallow structure of the Southern San Andreas Fault. Um, and so this is in collaboration with, uh, with a group from Scripps, uh, including uh, Yuri and Frank, um, as well as a number of uh, seismologists, uh, originally at least from USC and Yehuda Ben Zion's group. Um, and so I'm sure uh, to most folks in the audience, the Southern San Andreas leads a uh, minimal introduction. Um, it's the major plate boundary fault in Southern California and poses an extremely large uh, seismic hazard to uh, the region. Um, uh, in particular today, uh, I'll be focusing on the section from the Salton Sea to uh, where it bifurcates into the Mission Creek and Banning Fault strands. Um, and so, uh, of course, given the hazard associated with this portion of the fault, uh, it's been studied in detail over uh, many decades. Um, that being said, um, uh, the representation of the main uh, through going Southern San Andreas Fault interface in uh, the Coachella Valley uh, is simply traditionally thought to be a uh, canonical vertical strike slip fault. Um, and, and as uh, that is how it is modeled in the SCEC community fault model. Um, and so uh, uh, there is uh, in, in uh, some degree of, uh, or while, while there's minimal seismicity associated with um, uh, in the direct vicinity of the surface trace of the main fault. There is some seismicity present, um, but slightly offset to uh, the Northeast, uh, which is currently accommodated in the, uh, in the CFM by a subsidiary um, blind fault, which does not reach the surface. However, over the last uh, decade or so in particular, um, there've been a variety of uh, observations from geodesy to geomorphology and uh, array studies um, that indicate the entire through-going um, Southern San Andreas capable of large earthquakes has a substantial uh, Northeast uh, dip component, um, be it sort of uh, constant from the surface to greater depths or some degree of uh, uh, steepening towards the surface. And so, uh, however, the, the challenge with reconciling these uh, observations really is um, 
there's very few constraints on the uh, shallowest and near surface uh, fault geometry. Um, the seismicity that exists that could indicate uh, eastward dip are mostly limited to below about five kilometers depth or so. Um, and so uh, to this point, uh, it's been difficult to uh, ascertain whether or not um, the main fault interface uh, is in fact just a, a typical vertical strikes the fault or if there's, uh, it does at some depth begin to dip uh, and uh, potentially actually be better represented by this uh, subsidiary or what is currently uh, inferred to be a subsidiary structure. And so this uh, is sort of the observational gap that uh, our study is uh, seeking to fill. Um, we focus on the creeping section of uh, the Southern San Andreas uh, in the Coachella Valley and use uh, a dense catalog of INSAR, measure, uh, INSAR measurements to detect and model uh, shallow fault creep. And we also complement that with uh, analysis of fault zone reflected waves um, from a temporary dense nodal array deployed near the bifurcation uh, of the fault into the Mission Creek and Banning uh, fault segments. And so uh, with, with a, a dense catalog of INSAR observations and uh, modern uh, time series processing techniques, we can uh, obtain uh, a, a pretty dense map of uh, deformation along the fault. Um, and we take advantage of the fact that we have multiple viewing geometries and, and decompose the line of sight velocity fields uh, into the vertical and fault parallel components of displacement, the latter of which is shown here. Um, however, this is the uh, full scale, all horizontal um, deformation uh, that is occurring. And so we really are more interested in the near field uh, signal due to uh, solely due to shallow creep, which is evident from the, the discontinuity across the surface trace. And so in order to uh, obtain that, uh, we have to, uh, uh, we develop a model of the broad long wavelength secular tectonic deformation and remove that from uh, the whole scale INSAR observations in order to obtain a, a residual velocity field, um, which primarily reflects uh, the, um, the creep, uh, the signal due to shallow creep along the fault. And so in this case, uh, that's indicated again by the discontinuity and strong color contrast across the fault. Um, unfortunately, it, it decays and the data quality becomes slightly worse um, north towards the array, but um, we can perform a good analysis along a large portion of the fault and uh, compare the results um, nonetheless. And so this shallow creep, if we have a um, if we have observations of creep, uh, we can use um, those to develop models of the fault structure which uh, produce the observed deformation patterns. And so um, we do this in a somewhat uh, simplified fashion, um, in part due to the fact that the signal is quite low. It's on the order of uh, slip amplitudes of just several millimeters per year. Um, so we select profiles, uh, fault crossing profiles of the horizontal velocity field and perform inversions using just a simple uh, two-dimensional screw dislocation model with a tapering uh, slip distribution. Um, and we do so in a, in a Bayesian fashion uh, where uh, we're interested in the slip amplitude at the surface and the depth extent of creep, but in particular, the fault dip. Um, and so we, uh, from our inversion, we uh, develop an ensemble of likely fault geometries um, and a few examples uh, are shown in the panel below. And what's really notable about this is that um, while these are just several examples, at all locations along the fault, there's uh, the geodetic data prefers a northeastward dip. Um, that's shown here by these orange, uh, the orange lines, which are the reflect the depth extent, inferred depth extent of creep uh, and the um, uh, dip angle. And if we uh, uh, Look closely, you can see that there are very few, if any, um, model realizations that indicate uh, a vertical fault geometry or even a, a steeper fault geometry. Um, and if we uh, uh, just simply, you know, sort of de uh, develop a, a cone of likely uh, range of uh, fault locations at depth, 
Um, in general, this corresponds quite well with a lot of the micro seismicity that are observed in the area. Um, and so while this is not let necessarily a physically coupled explanation connecting these two, um, the, the connecting the shallow surface to these um, micro seismicity at depth, there's a very strong preference from geodesy that uh, prefers uh, a shallow configuration, uh, a shallow dipping configuration. And so this is complemented with uh, analysis of a fault zone reflected and transmitted waves um, from a temporary array deployment um, uh, installed across the bifurcation of the fault. And uh, it was uh, deployed for approximately one month and recorded uh, reflected uh, fault zone waves from approximately 30 events. And I should note that all of this analysis is done by uh, Hong Roy Tu and uh, others uh, from USC, including Peter and Yehuda. And so uh, they were able to take advantage of the fact that the arrays uh, detecting both reflected and transmitted waves in order to develop a new reverse time migration uh, scheme, which um, back propagates and correlates uh, the reflected and transmitted wave fields uh, to uh, image the reflectivity structure, which produced those uh, wave phases. And this is important uh, to note because this means that there's no source information required um, for the, the uh, events that produce these waves. And so with that, over integrating the correlation uh, over time, you can obtain uh, a map of the reflectivity structure of the fault zones that uh, produce these uh, wave phases. Um, and so the, the faults here are highlighted by large absolute values of intensity. And we can, again, uh, see that at this location, there's a definite distinct um, northeast dip of both the Banning and Mission Creek segments. Um, and while the resolution decreases with depth, uh, there's some indication of, of uh, uh, increased dip toward uh, with greater depths. And so in short, um, these sort, uh, techniques uh, and observations of, of near field uh, or in the near field along the Southern San Andreas have allowed us to place better constraints on the shallow fault geometry. Uh, and while this is sort of a, a case study for the Southern San Andreas, um, these could be applied to other faults in the area. Um, in particular, the, well, um, uh, INSAR requires that there's um, some sort of uh, slip occurring. Um, however, there are many uh, creeping faults that exist in Southern California and other locations. And so um, INS uh, INSAR data quality is at a point now where we can start really um, detecting and modeling those very small signals. Um, and something else to note too is that um, from the instrument instrumentational standpoint, um, the quality and coherence of INSAR data um, can be used to identify sites that may benefit more from uh, improved instrumentation uh, uh, or uh, uh, sites that require better instrumentation potentially through Roughzo. Um, and I, again, to specifically potentially target creep uh, on, on faults that are known to experience shallow creep. Um, and then, of course, uh, having an allocation for a dense nodal array like the one employed in this study. Um, would allow, you know, without uh, um, a ton of uh, uh, knowledge of source information to be able to uh, improve greatly the knowledge of the shallow structure along some of these faults. And some of these, I think, are already suggested um, in the implementation plan for REFSO. Um, but I think that these were uh, what we thought um, in particular was uh, most important from our study. So with that, I'll take a question if there's time. Thank you, Ellis. That was that was a very impressive. A whole a whole new array of tools that we can use to image fault zones that are relatively aseismic. Um, there is a there is a time for for a question. If if there's one, I know a lot of people here on the call have probably worked a little bit on the southernmost San Andreas, the section that Ellis was referring to. Um, so, is there a question? We can take one if there is, or we can leave it for the discussion. That's okay too. Oh, it's, I don't know who came up first, but maybe Craig, Craig Nicholson, uh, if you can unmute yourself, uh, the floor is yours. Um, uh, thank you, Ellis. That was a very good presentation. Uh, 
I first just wanted to clarify a little bit about the uh, community fault model. Um, the community fault model always had the San Andreas fault northeast dipping uh, north of the bifurcation in the Indio Hills. The Banning Fault was dipping typically at a dip of about 70 degrees and the Mission Creek Fault dipping at about 80 degrees. Um, the preference for a vertical San Andreas Fault south of that down to the Salton Sea is because when we do actually see micro earthquakes on the Southern San Andreas at the Salton Sea, uh, south of Bombay Beach, uh, <clears throat> those micro earthquakes define a very strong vertical planar surface, both in the hypocenters and the nodal planes. And uh, going back over some of the um, uh, results and interpretations of other modeling that uh, infers a northeast dipping San Andreas Fault most of that modeling is based on the assumption that there's only one active fault system there rather than the potential of adjacent faults like um, the Southern San Andreas and the Mecca Hills Hidden Springs faults. So the question that I had for you is your results in the Indio Hills is very consistent with a whole number of other different geophysical observations, including gravity and uh, geomagnetic modeling that indicates that over in the upper three to four kilometers, the Southern San Andreas is near vertical to steeply dipping. Uh, and most of the evidence for a more moderate dip is based on analyzing that data uh, below its uh, sort of optimal depth of resolution. Uh, the issue that I have with your creep, or the question that I have with your creeping results is to what extent is your modeling, again, based on the assumption that you're only looking at one fault and whether or not you actually could be looking at uh, one or more parallel fault systems for example, when you look at something like the Laguna Salada Fault and the Sierra Kukapa Fault that uh, ruptured in 2010, those false systems are basically adjacent to each other and an anastomosing at the surface, but they define distinctly different fault systems at depth. So again, somewhat of a long question, I apologize, but I was just curious, again, to what extent are a number of these models for a Northeast dip to the San Andreas, are they based on assuming there's only one active fault? And how would you explain uh, the results that some of the models come up with a moderately dipping San Andreas fault starting from the surface trace whereas others come up with a moderately dipping fault starting at a depth of nine kilometers below the surface. Those two geometries are not compatible with each other. Well, thank, thanks for the question, Craig. And I agree that like um, in general, these uh, more recent observations are certainly uh, limited in their depth extent um, in terms of the resolution. Um, in particular, uh, for the geodetic component, which considers uh, creep near the surface, um, well, we do assume that uh, there's only one actively uh, creeping um, fault, uh, in, which is more or less evident along the um, uh, um, from the uh, the magnitude of the signal here, well, which is the one that we are inverting. Um, and so we do assume that um, there's only one fault in, in this case that is contributing to the observed uh, deformation. Um, and so 
I, I, we could, in principle, allow for some other uh, structures to be present. Um, I think what's maybe challenging with accounting for something different is that, um, well, first of all, the data is quite, um, is, is limited to some extent, um, both in terms of the fact that it's a very small signal, um, but also it's uh, fairly spatially localized. Um, which in general reflects the depth extent of the process that's occurring. Um, and so just based off of the, the, um, uh, the, the spatial structure of um, the observed deformation, I feel like it's probably unlikely that there is another um, uh, deeper fault that's contributing to it. But of course, the, we know that fault zones are very complex. Um, and so there's certainly this is you know in in a in a regard one of the more simple ways we could have addressed this problem and we are doing more active research um, you know uh, potentially in well doing 3D inversions and incorporating um, more elastic heterogeneity and whatnot um, and so it's certainly a, a, a an active research question um, this is more or less the results from our uh, you know, the first analysis we've performed so far. And hopefully, um, to, to some extent, we can continue to improve to the quality of the insert data we, if we get more acquisitions or if, uh, additional creep episodes occur. Um, but I, I certainly agree that there's uh, a lot of, um, uh, the, there's still a, a work to be done in terms of really trying to pin down the deeper structure and the connection to the deeper structure. But, um, the 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 takeaway that we found from modeling creep in particular is that the um, the, the geodetic data really prefers a, sh a dipping shallow fault geometry. So I, I hope that um, covered most of your question, but let me know if not. Yeah, I think um, I, th I think in respect to time, we should probably move on. But this is a a great example of slightly differing views on the structure and how a facility like Rufso could probably bridge that gap and give us a more coherent view of what the Southern San Andreas is doing, for example. But let's move on. And so our, our next speaker is, is Nate Onderdonk. He's a professor from Cal State Long Beach. He focuses on a variety of topics uh, from structural geology, active tectonics, geomorphology. And he's gonna give us a, a, a sense of what signals we are seeing very near the surface of these major faults and fault zones and what that tell us about uh, slip history, fault behavior in the future potentially, and which of these fault systems are prone to the next major event. So, so Nate, take it away if you don't mind. Okay, thank you, Peter. Yeah, so I was asked to, to give a quick summary of the paleoseismology of these major fault strands that we're interested in. And then I'll also give um, you know, a view from the, from the standpoint of an earthquake geologist on the project. Um, so I, you know, some of this background is coming from a lot of different people's work. I listed quite a few of them here on the left, and I'm sure I've, I've left out some people. So um, trying to advance my slide. There we go. Just to reiterate, I tried to compile the most recent ruptures along this um, Southern San Andreas fault system, and I've you notice I've, I've color coded the segments here. Um, the next slide has meaning for those colors, but I think uh, one of the reasons I did that was just to emphasize that from an earthquake geology viewpoint, this system is segmented. I don't know from a seismology viewpoint if it's as significant, but we tend to view it that way. And I think that's an important thing to think about for this project. But a couple of things to point out here. the. The Mojave San Andreas segment is ruptured twice, at least in the last 250 years, with 1812 and then again in 1857. And the red is kind of the extent of the 1857 rupture. Uh, and then down in the in the southern part, we've seen quite a bit of activity in the last um, 100 years. The Imperial Fault, Laguna Salada Fault, the southern San Jacinto, and not a whole lot in the southern San Andreas and um, you know, I guess the northern San Jacinto has also been about 100 years, I mean, over 200 years now. So here is the same fault map, but 
what I did here is I put the years since the most recent rupture on the left, comparing that to the average recurrence time of that of ruptures on that fault from paleoseismology. So now I've color coded the faults to places where the current open period or hiatus is longer than the average recurrence in the world. Yellow is where it's pretty close. Blue is where the current open period is much shorter than the average recurrence interval. And black is, I, I don't know, maybe somebody knows, but I don't know. Um, so I think this just to highlight that much of the Southern San Andreas and the, the San Jacinto, um, you know, where the current open period is longer than the average recurrence interval. Whereas many of these faults down here to the South, um, you know, may not be as stressed as some of the, these other segments. So, you know, from a very simplistic viewpoint, then we could say that a lot of these faults are quote unquote overdue for an earthquake. And this is an idea that's been kicked around for decades now. Um, I wanted to just look in a little more detail from a paleoseismology viewpoint of that idea. So what I'm showing here is event histories from a couple paleoseismic sites in the San Bernardino Cajon Pass area. So on the left here, we have two sites on the San Bernardino section of the San Andreas, so it's Borough Flats and Pittman Canyon. Um, if you're not familiar with these diagrams, the zero AD is on the bottom, and these are PDFs of the earthquake ages. So the year 2000 AD is shown at the top. So we have two sites on the San Bernardino section of the San Andreas. Uh, Wrightwood, you can see, is has got about twice as many events as once you get south of the Cone Pass. And then two sites on the northern San Jacinto, so Mystic Lake here and Hog Lake on the far right. So I think the, the important thing to note is that even though almost all of these fault segments are, are you know, apparently overdue, but we know that surface ruptures are certainly not regular. Um, and there's plenty of places where you could, within the error of the earthquake dates, hide 150 years on in Wrightwood, 250 years in or more in uh, the San Jacinto. So the point being that because these aren't regular events, um, it's not really correct to say that we're totally overdue for an earthquake and that we should be expecting one or expecting a surface rupture immediately. However, um, you know, looking at the at the broader picture, we see that there are many periods in time where we have multiple earthquakes on uh, these faults in a short period of time. So here's just one example, you know, where I can put a 50 year period where we conceivably had at least an earthquake on every single one of these segments, um, again, noting that there's an error in our in our dates here that we can't get really any more narrower based on the radiocarbon. So yes, it's true that there's a possibility that you know we may not see something in the next 30 years, but I think we have a much better chance of catching a rupture cascade, as, as Kate and Doug called it in the 2020 paper, um, than we do of not catching anything. So I think, you know, I guess all I'm doing is just trying to emphasize the need for this this project, which sounds like a good idea to me, because I think there's a good chance that we would see not only a single event, but maybe how these different fault segments are interacting. Um, so now I wanted to give a little bit of opinions from the view of an earthquake geologist. And I emphasize one earthquake geologist because I actually, for some reason, didn't even was not even aware of this project until last week. So I have not pulled the whole earthquake geology community. And this was just some ideas that, that I thought of since Peter asked me to, to give this talk. Um, so, but a couple of things. One, what is the ratio of co-seismic slip to after slip? This seems to be something that would be important for us as earthquake geologists and also for the consulting geologists that are constantly trying to estimate hazards at different sites. Um, I know it was really interesting in the Napa earthquake to see the amount of after slip that was recorded. But that's something that we can't distinguish in a trench. So we're oftentimes trying to understand what is the slip per event? You know, how large were these paleo earthquakes to get an idea of the longer history of a fault? And you're just, we're just looking at offset features in trenches. So here is a buried channel shown in yellow along the San Jacinto fault. 
we know this occurred in two events. There's about six meters of offset. So we're saying, you know, three meter event here. So we can do this from subsurface trenching. We can also do it by looking at the topography. An example from Zelke in 2010. These are stream offsets along the central San Andreas. We start to recognize, you know, these might be individual events of about five meters in size. So, um, but if there is a considerable amount of afterslip in one of these earthquakes, then we might be overestimating earthquake magnitudes, um, or in some cases, we might be underestimating. So having an observatory that it can actually monitor that in real time would be, I think, a huge advantage for understanding how these faults rupture. Um, numbers two, uh, it'd be interesting to know what the how much do the secondary faults and smaller faults contribute to the overall strain? So in trenches, we often see pretty wide zones of faulting. This is Mystic Lake on the San Jacinto. We got the main fault zone over here, which is in itself, you know, eight meters wide of, of faulting. The secondary fault zone over here showing some of the same events, same time periods. And this second fault zone is a full what, 25 meters away. And at Mystic Lake, we initially had a trench that was about a half a kilometer wide, and we saw, you know, ruptures all through that. Um, now, that might be a, a unique situation because it's in the middle of a step over, but the main point is that, you know, we do see these secondary faults, and is that something that we need to consider from a hazard point of view and from a, you know, a site building point of view for the consultants? Or is the, are these minor and not something to be to worry about? And then my third point was, I can see how this project would teach us a lot about how ruptures move through stepovers. And again, emphasizing that this, this fault system is full of stepovers, bifurcation zones, places where there's parallel segments for quite a long period of uh, distance, a long distance. So how segmented are these fault zones? I mean, this is the, the modeling suggests that um, ruptures might stop at, at uh, these steps. And we've had, of course, you know, compilations by Westnowski, for example, of historic ruptures and looking at how steps dictated that. But being able to, to monitor that in real time, of course, I think would tell us a lot about how we characterize the long-term fault hazard of these fault zones. Um, now, just to finish a, a couple points here of what an earthquake geologist would like to see in terms of the project design. And again, because this is brand new to me, I apologize if I'm bringing up ideas that have already been kicked around. But, but this figure, my initial impression looking at it was that this even spacing doesn't seem to make much sense to me. Um, and I think it would be more interesting to put these arrays and concentrate the money and the effort at interesting locations. So, I mean, having a bunch of, you know, arrays along a relatively simple section of the San Andreas where it's straight, of course, nothing simple, but, you know, would be less productive than really concentrating on these, you know, stepovers, bifurcation, even trifurcation zone along the central San Jacinto, parallel strands. And I also think it'd be really interesting to have one or two of these at well-studied trench sites. So for example, Wrightwood, Mystic Lake, Hog Lake, where you have, you know, 2000 year record of earthquakes to compare, you know, well, what was the damage in this modern earthquake if we catch one to, to what we see over the last 2000 years? Was this characteristic? Was it unusual? You know, to calibrate what we're seeing in trenches, that can then be extrapolated throughout the entire San Andreas fault system and not just the site that we observed. Um, the second point would be to let the location of these arrays dictate the width. And so I saw some comments coming up before my talk that I totally agree with. I mean, you, you, you know, it might be more advantageous to have wide arrays at steps and, and splits and, um, and narrower way arrays at places where you have relatively simple segments. I think this paper by um, Tom and Yehuda a while back, they were showing examples of where paleo earthquakes had been really narrowly defined to millimeters, even centimeter zones of slip um, at Hog Lake. 
Uh, and then, as I mentioned already, in other places, we see really wide zones. So it might be that mature faults have very narrow rupture zones, whereas evolving faults might have more tens of meters wide zone. And so, um, you know, taking into consideration the site in terms of how to construct the array, what kind of instruments are there, how wide it would be, I think would be a very valuable uh, thing to do, think about. So um, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nate. That was, uh, that was, that was really awesome. And I think I, I've had to commend you because it's, it's so in line with those questions that are driving the center, which is, you know, what is the science that you're after? You know, in your case, you want to see how many slip surfaces in a single location actually participate in the event. And then also, are there more than one major fault strand participating in that event? And then secondly, you know, how do we get off to measuring these type signals? And you did a really good job at um at him doing that. And and if I can maybe kick off the discussion, um, uh, just to 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 respect time. Uh, so, you know, you said like a couple of locations um, we should focus on in terms of the, the major fault strands. But then, uh, what is the aperture of some of these arrays that 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 you wanna would wanna see, for example, at some of these locations? And yes, feel free to go back to to your slides. I think you make a strong point in terms of focusing on complexity, right? Regions of excessive complexity. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, where the fault zones are less complex, I mean, like the, the extent of the B4 LIDAR seems to be much wider than, in most places, wider than the, the width of deformation that we see. So, you know, in these simpler sections, for, from an earthquake geologist viewpoint, maybe just, you know, 100 meters is sufficient. Now, you know, I don't know what the considerations are in terms of measuring ground motion and, you know, what, what seismologists need. Um, and then in other sections where there's stepovers like this, this step over in the San Jacinto, you know, that's, I think, maybe like four kilometers wide, you know, five kilometers wide. So I think it could vary. I mean, and again, I don't know, you know, what the cost considerations are, but um, I think it would be worth doing a couple of these wider places where you're almost like four or five kilometers wide, if that's possible. I see Yehuda has a question. Yeah, let's. What, what does the community think about about Knight's thesis? Um, <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. I think I see. Yehuda raises his hand, and who else? Um, oh, Yehuda and Frank. <laughs> yeah, so I'll just jump in. So I fully agree with what Nate has been saying, and with previous uh, speakers, uh, we cannot, we should not uh, consider, you know, uh, the array design in a uniform fashion. It would be important to have a blend. I just want to make a comment, Nate, that even on a simple section of the San Andreas Fault, for example, or any fault, uh, there are many processes, dynamic processes that are not seen right now in the data and are ignored. For example, the, I mean, the, 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 the Mojave section of the San Andreas Fault, if you look at the detailed geology, is in fact a fault zone. It's not a line. It has the weeds. During rupture, without a question, there are, there's a combination of uh, dilatation and shear deformation. The shear is dominant, but the dilatation helps to accommodate it and completely changes the energy, energy partitioning, et cetera. So in fact, we want to capture some large earthquakes on so-called simple faults to understand the fuller extent of the physical processes that are occurring within a rupture zone. But again, I agree with you that we need to, we will be limited, you know, how, do, how, how can we sort of uh, use our budget uh, appropriately, but I agree that we need different designs in different places and perhaps selecting one really long array, uh, you know, it came up for that, that leverages on existing stations and ball. I think this could be very, uh, very useful. We should consider this, sure. So real quick, and, you know, a question that I had, and again, I apologize because, you know, this is brand new to me, is, is the Elsinore fault. I mean, when you look at the you know, the, the probability of a rupture there, is that worth monitoring or should we, would you focus all the attention to San Andreas and San Jacinto? I agree that the El Sino is less important. 
I, I, I agree with this. On the other hand, there's, you know, is a continuation of the Laguna Celada. I mean, this is something we will have to resolve. Eventually, we will have uh, later, uh, in a few months, we're going to have an in-person larger meeting that will try to finalize the design or finesse the design. And it's it's a fair question. I agree that El Sino is less important. Frank, did you? Um... Well, basically, I'm, I was, I'm in total agreement with Yehuda. He's basically hit all the points there. I think it's really important to understand the where the, the regions of fall complexity are, but also I don't think from a understanding of rupture propagation and fault dynamics that we really, from a geophysical point of view, have as good an understanding as we should of even what Nate has brought forward as some of the more simpler uh, places on the fault. So I, I would say I wouldn't I wouldn't um, deprecate the what the quote unquote simple areas are, but I would certainly uh, uh, agree with that we need to have uh, different or fault uh, designs and things like different array designs for different parts where it's more complex or less complex. So that was we, just follow up to Yehuda. <laughs> no, I just say, yeah, we need to capture different environments from so-called simple fault geometry to creeping sections to complex sections. Absolutely. And we need, and we need to spread carefully you know, the budget that we will plan on to capture all of these environments. But I'm just, uh, again, there's a, lots of processes are completely hidden, even on a simple fault. They're just not captured by uh, all the details uh, disappear when you, are, when you have sensors that are a few, five, 10 kilometers away from the fault. All the high frequencies go away. So we got to get close, even um, in particular, with simpler. I mean, we will discover lots of physics. Yeah, I mean, it's probably in incorrect to call them simple because you know you go like you, you know go to the san andreas there in the mojave and it's it's wide there's multiple strands you know there is no simple section of the fault anywhere around here you know so but it's just a matter of i guess exactly. doing repeated uh lines along something where the, the characteristics are the same you know what i mean like yes the characteristics are somewhat similar for you know 15 kilometers and you obviously maybe just one array there is enough yeah the problem here I'll, I'll i'll say you want to comment and stop the problem is that we don't really know when the next set of transcripts will occur you know, that's the point this is why we put multi -tier. but you are right it can be a relatively straight section can be sampled maybe less densely perhaps and and we move our instruments elsewhere to, to yeah it's, it's 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 a good point no 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 there's no one solution here we need to Think carefully about it. Yeah, that's why that's why we have this great group of people together, so we can <laughs> come up with the strategy. Frank, did you want to make a short comment? Yeah, I had a no, not a comment, but I had a follow up question for Nate. Um, having looked at a lot of the paleo seismological studies, it's sort of like the one thing we know about paleo seismology; those are the identified events that actually rupture the surface. And what is sort of the minimum size event? And you sort of alluded to that in one of your slides, but I was trying to get a, you know, uh, what size, what's kind of the minimum size event that we might observe with kind of a 20 kilometer nominal spacing between um, arrays. The minimal size event that would rupture the surface, I, I think is, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it depends on so many things, but I would, to just give a ballpark number, I would say yeah. six, hmm. magnitude six, I think. Probably most of the events that you see in trenches are 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 greater than that. Um, I don't but that know. also I don't means know if also, is still but, on here, but she might have. Yeah, but points. I think the other thing is, I mean, it also means up to up to kind of the low sixes, we could easily see good size events inside these fault zones that we can observe, even if they don't propagate rupture all the way to the surface. We could still learn lots of the physics and an understanding of how these things work, uh, even with those type of events. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. I, I was just talking about what's the chances of catching a surface rupture, right? But I mean, undoubtedly, there's going to be, you know, multiple magnitude six events over the next 30 years, right? So even if they don't actually rupture the surface. I, I, I see Kate has a hand, right? But before we go to you, Kate, I, I did see... Um... I did see our first speaker, Elizabeth and Jamie, uh, contribute to the chat. Did, 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 did you want to chime in, Elizabeth or Jamie, or you're happy with uh, the record that's on chat on this topic? 
Yeah, that, uh, that's fine for now. Maybe we'll return back to that discussion. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And Jamie? You want to keep these slides up or you want me to take this down? Are we... Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Maybe, <laughs> maybe take them down for now and let's okay. see. Or maybe let, let's see if Kate has a question referring to your slides. And, and Kate, do you, um, um, no, it's not referring to the slides as a more general uh, question. One of the things that you can get on the Southern San Andreas through here, just thinking about the design is, um, you know, you have steep topography on one side or the other for, uh, you know, along the Mojave, you have uh, to the south and uh, along sort of the more complex step over section, it's sort of, sort of to the north. But I'm wondering if there's interesting um, uh, seismological properties you've been interested in, in looking at because you have uh, this strong contrast in topography and also the bedrock structure itself across there. So I'm wondering if also the bigger geometric uh, features like the giant mountains <laughs> um, mm. might provide a, another uh, uh, reason to, to place you know, an array here versus there or something like that. And yeah, magnitude six or even 6.5 so, uh, and above, I would uh, agree with that. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, Jean-Philippe? You, yeah, thank you, Peter. Hand? I wanted to come back to the, um, to the presentation we, we had from uh, Elizabeth. Uh, she covered two examples, one in Southern Texas, where there was obviously an injection and we could see the seismicity rate changing in relation to those injection. And then there was the Kawea uh, swarm where uh, there's a suspicion that all of that is driven by, by fluids. Uh, but in fact, this is an inference, right? There is no direct, uh, no direct observations pointing, pointing to uh, fluids being involved. You could argue that the Kawi uh, swarm could be looked at uh, like a, a, an earthquake developing in, 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 in slow motion and on, on maybe uh, uh, large earthquakes are, are, are similar in many ways and on fluids might be involved as well. So that brings me to, uh, to the question that I, I would have for you actually, Peter. Uh, if, if fluids are involved, in, in an example like Kahuya or in large earthquake, what's the prospect of, of using uh, electric potential measurement of or electromagnetic measurements uh, mon monitoring in the real time to actually uh, uh, demonstrate that flus are, are, are really there or, or quantify their role? Yeah, uh, thanks, Jean-Philippe. Uh, so, so the answer is in, in, in the EM world or the MT world, we're, we're, just, we're just not there yet in terms of monitoring, but in fact, we are moving forward. I know for a fact there's a team of EM specialists up in Mount St. Helens right now, and they are going to monitor that volcano for about a two, three year period and see if they can track fluids, et cetera, et cetera, in that volcanic system. So, so we, we, we are not, not there yet, I think. I, I, I do think it's possible. It, it might take a little bit of a technologi technological advance on that front. Um, but yeah. Is it, is it because of the stability of the electrodes, the problem, or is it? Yeah, the, the electrodes would be the problem, yeah, because yeah. You, know, you have resistance that you're, you're interested in the, in the Earth's resistance or conductivity, mm -hmm. but, but the sense is the electrodes themselves have a contact resistance, and that's something that changes in time because of rainfall, yeah, yeah. moisture, whatever it may be. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so you have this noise signal overprinted on everything else, and, and that does cause a problem. There are ways to get around it, but we just haven't done enough case studies to actually see if we can get around it effectively. So the answer is, I'm really hopeful, <laughs> um, and people are working on it, and this is definitely something to explore. Um, do we have some, so Cliff uh, Thurber, uh, did you want to unmute yourself or you're happy with uh, the question you left in the, in the chat? Well, it's just an issue of memory or lack thereof, whether there was, um, like some EM monitoring going on at the time of the Parkfield 2004 earthquake. I just don't remember. Yeah, I, I, I can't recall myself right now, um, but if it was, you know, maybe it wasn't too successful. I'm not sure because I haven't heard much from it. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, this is, this is definitely something to explore. 
I mean, in my opinion, we should at least, if, if we decide on doing campaign events, uh, mapping, fault zone structure, maybe even the presence of fluids, uh, even just one snapshot of it um, across various profiles, that is definitely something to incorporate in this observatory, even though we can't yet monitor it on the scale of seismic or geodetic data or whatever it may be. Um, I, I did want to, so, you know, we've heard from geodesists, seismologists, and also geology people. Maybe, is there somebody from um, the numerical simulation crowd or people working on rupture physics uh, that can comment on, on the scale or, you know, the separation of these different across fault profiles or how far the sensors need to be? Is, is, there, is there somebody from, from that crowd who can comment on that, if at all possible? And also, we all we always welcome the the early career folk to to provide some input as well. We are very interested in in what you think. Um, you know, you are the future, and you'll be the ones who steer this forward. So it's really important to hear from all of you. There's another workshop, right? That's going to focus on uh, rup, you know, earthquake source physics, rupture dynamics. Which that that question is going to be come up for sure. There, I would imagine. Yeah. Okay. We may be missing a group of that group of people or the, or the majority of those people in this session. Yeah, we'll certainly cover that in um, you know a couple of weeks in our in our session. I don't think any of my I would hate to speak for the ACE numerical modelers um, community that is going to be there and presenting, but um, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it's, I think it's the classic issue. You've got different problems at different scales and everyone wants a different geometry to study a different problem. Um, so I think there's not, there's not one right solution, but I think if we have a kind of a diverse portfolio, we might have a chance. So. Yeah, no, that's totally. So we have many more of these calls and I'll recommend that everyone tunes in if they have time. Um, Yehuda, did you have another comment? Question, open question to the uh, people from the community who are present uh, in this meeting. I'm just curious what kind of uh, uh, configuration of geodetic sensors they think they would like to see that could augment already the existing regional network uh, inside and all other remote sensors that mm. can be done for space. What should we do? What would you guys recommend we do very close to faults in the other? Yeah, a good point. Frank, Frank, do you wanna do you might wanna maybe go ahead and 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 put up on the screen that slide that shows you know iteration zero of of what what this may look like, and maybe that could steer the conversation of what what the geodetic community would like to see. And yeah, Frank, maybe just elaborate what's what all these colors and symbols. This this is the, the figure you're thinking of, Peter. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, so basically the idea was to have a, you know two a, a, some uh, two dimensional array with different properties with uh, strong motion um, uh, sensors of kind of and broadband sensors and uh, co located in a post hole package. Um, we were talking about getting high rate GNSS things on a cross array fault. Um, you can see the scale links where we have a couple hundred meters, 600 meters to uh, almost two kilometers off fault is what we've been looking at initially. All these things can be scaled, obviously. We can make them wider. We can make them narrower, depending on what the uh, uh, objectives are at any particular fault zone. And the other thing that's kind of interesting that really hasn't been done is the integration of um, high, you know, high frame rate camera, well, even just normal frame rate cameras that are looking across the fault to help capture imagery at the same time as any significant events go by or any events that get triggered from somewhere else for that matter. So that's kind of the basic level of things. Um, you know, this isn't, we are still, as Yehuda mentioned earlier, there will be further workshops to help refine this like geometry and things like that. And one of the other things they say we do, since we have these two, each, nominal arrays actually has a two dimensionality that we actually get a bunch of sub arrays scattered up and down the state on um, the different set of the fault zones it can you can do back projection on, a, on the opposite fault for for instance so anyway um peter i'll turn it back to you 
I'll leave this. Yeah, no, no, up. thanks, Frank. But but if you don't mean uh, don't mind leaving it up, and and yeah. so if there's somebody from you know the Judea community, you know, kind of what's what's missing here? Uh, what would you like to see, uh, Jean Philippe? Yes, uh, really, what I would like to see added would be uh, fiber optics across the fault, uh, either at the surface or even better in shallow boreholes. Uh, to measure strain as a function of time. We could do that as well, but, but strain would be extremely useful in particular to, to determine the, the, the width of the, of the shear zone, whether it's co-seismic or it's creep. I think that that would be extremely valuable uh, information. And I don't think it would be that costly. Yeah. And are you thinking about a two-dimensional array design sort of thing for the fiber optics? Well, I, I would just... Uh, with cables across, uh, a two-dimensional would be fine. Yeah, it would be a cable across the fault line. Yeah, mm -hmm. horizontal. Uh, and you would like to monitor, uh, I don't know, at least 500 meters, but it could be a kilometer. Yeah. But if you do, I mean, also, the, I mean, my question is, again, would fault parallel also improve our understanding if you were at the 500 meter range off of either side? Yeah, actually, the ideal might be to have two fibers at 45 degrees from the fault. Actually, that might be okay. the ideal setup, in fact. Okay. Yeah. But uh, maybe we could have a discussion with people who are more specialized in that area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, that's, those are excellent points. And then what are the rest of um, what are the rest of us think? I mean, just remember, uh, we're talking about an observatory, uh, um, but but all instruments that we put in don't have to be in long term. We can do multiple campaign events also, and and get critical information out of that. You know, before, during, or after um, this ob observatory goes in. So you know, the, the floor is open. And so I have a. I agree, I agree with the point that uh, Jean Philippe made, and I think too. These two lines that are 45 degrees is very, very clever. Uh, and, and I think we want to put this uh, permanent, actually, in one or two places. We will learn a lot about fault zone processes with such lines, even in the interseismic period. We need to choose these locations carefully. This would be an example to go back to Nate's talk. We might, you know, Nate, Nate's point, you know, a simple, relatively simple location, I think, would be good here. That uh, uh, we will find a lot of, we will discover lots of additional processes, even in relatively simple location, with lines like this. So there's a question here about: Is there any plan to have any temporal no temporal no deployments during rough so to have larger and denser seismic arrays? And the answer is yes. That I mean, each the um, Peter, I may turn this over to you on that. Uh, can you have that slide that we talked about from uh, yeah. you know, Lay's paper that you can toss up there so we can talk about that? Well, do I just need you to stop sharing? Um, I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, the, the, work, the work Frank is referring to, I don't know, do you want to go ahead? No, go ahead. You, you go. No, no, the, the work that Frank's referring to is exactly to Santiago's uh, question. Um, this is something we've been doing along the San Jacinto for more than a decade now, right, Frank? Um, and essentially, yes, there are permanent networks in there, but we've supplemented these with uh, dense nodal arrays of various types. And I'm showing you four examples at four different locations here on the right um, of the San Jacinto. And you can see with, with those type of data, you can start to map not only the crustal blocks on either side of a fault zone, but you can show where damage is more intense. That's what we refer to as the core damage zone that's near, uh, you know, where fault plane has slipped or has slipped several times. And then we can also define, you know, broader damage zones. And maybe these are zones that contain secondary faults uh, that are off the primary slip surface. And then we can also look in, in depth, which is the leftmost figure here. And that shows you how some of these features propagate down. Um, so yes, the answer is yes. These, uh, um, these nodal deployments are very much uh, part of the tentative plan. But what shape that takes is up to the community. And, and I have to add, you know, um, the focus here is on geodesy seismology. But as Jean Philippe, Philippe said, there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of other geophysics. Uh, we haven't even spoken about potential fields, for example, um, that can be deployed as part of this campaign. Um, Jamie? Yeah, I, I was just going to say that we have to keep in mind that 
you know, if something like this gets built, that infrastructure that's in place at each one of these arrays is going to be able to support it is becomes a laboratory that other people are going to want to use, right? They're going to say, hey, can I put this instrument out there and hook it into your network and power, right, into your infrastructure? So we, we have to keep in mind there's the cost to build the initial array, and, and we may not have the ability to add a, every instrument that everybody wants, but the idea, and we need to make sure this is clear in the proposal, is that this becomes a facility that other people can use and add their particular instrument or a new instrument that we haven't even thought of yet, whatever comes in the future, right? So um, that's the, an important piece of this, yeah, I think. Ja Jamie, I totally agree with you in that we have to, and having these things be scalable, You, we've done enough of this to realize that how many things come along later, you can go, oh, that'd be really cool to add in. So the real, one of the key attributes of these arrays is having enough commun real-time communications and enough uh, power there. Power. To scale these. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah. it knows that's the physical reality of how we have to work, but that's also part of the, you know, something we're not going to get a chance to touch much upon is the workforce uh, training and people who can learn how to do these things and, and develop that next set of observations in here. Yeah. Now, Philippe, you... Yeah. I think it's a might be an. Old no, no, sorry, I thought I forgot to lower my hand. Um, 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 Ellis, Ellis, did you wanna did you wanna talk a little bit about your comment in the chat? I think it's a good one. Oh yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I was going back to uh, Yehuda's question specifically regarding um, additional geodetic instrumentation to complement SAR. Um, in in general, a lot of uh, probably the most interesting regions in Southern California do have a lot of uh, persistently reflective structures in the in the desert or bedrock uh, urban structures. But as it, as is evident in particular in the case of the Southern San Andreas, where there, the fault kind of runs through on the margin of a uh, very uh, active agricultural area, the uh, uh, insar coherence and signal quality really takes a dive. Um, and so in, in principle, I think it would be pretty straightforward to um, look at um, like time averaged maps of INSAR coherence over many interferograms and acquisitions to try to identify um, sites and in particular sites which may, um, uh, our combination of uh, lacking INSAR coverage and are also geologically, geophysically interesting. Um, to, to focus some of the geodetic instrumentation uh, in a more dense fashion, because I think the, uh, the the basic kind of four um, GNSS station linear arrays may be challenging to really pin down a lot of um, processes in terms of things that are going on, not uh, co-seismically, but that's just my um, in initial impression. Um, uh, but yeah, some some regions could certainly d benefit from having some good uh, on the ground kind of pin down points to help uh, to to fill in and validate the INSAR measurements. Um, Very cool. And and these are it, it sounds like some of these might be actually a little bit of a distance away from these mapped surface traces, or or are they? Or when you mean supplement, it's 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 on fault, or it's a little bit more off fault. Um, I. I uh well certainly in the well so in the case of of creeping faults um within the closer to the fault will will be better in particular to kind of constrain um not just the amplitude of of slip that's occurring at the surface but in particular the the asymmetry in the case of if there if if one's trying to invert for non-vertical or um or any fault geometry for that matter because that it really is manifested as uh, asymmetry across the fault. Um, and so um, the, yeah. the closer to that you kind of are better able to, to pin down um, th that, uh, that those measurements. Um, of, of course, for co-seismic processes, um, any scale probably that would be implemented would, would be useful, but Again, near near field is important because at least for uh, INSAR, there's also typically a lot of view correlation in the near field, which can be filled in by uh, other um, image processing and uh, techniques. But um, 
that, that would also be useful in the co-seismic uh, case too, to really constrain well the, um, uh, the, the near field uh, deformation and, uh, and slip at the surface. Yeah, that all that all sounds yeah very much worth worth diving into more. Um, I, I see there are a couple of comments. I, I just wanted to. There's a different. Uh, there's a topic of you know this 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 observatory is, is can be a one of a kind. It's also one of a kind in terms of the education and experience it can offer to the next generation of uh, geoscientists among us. And I was wondering. I mean, you know, my own students certainly don't have access to these type of field based skills and. You know, working on an observatory like that. I don't know. Does anyone have some ideas and feelings about you know how how best we can incorporate the next generation of scientists in a in a project like this? I I left it for last, not because it's least important. Uh, it's just kind of the the way today has panned out. Um, but yeah, anybody have an idea about workforce development and and how can we best incorporate that? I know it's quite an open ended question. Yeah, Yehuda. Well, the obvious answer is that this kind of observatory will provide such a wealth of confusing signals that I think uh, will provide incredible challenges to the next generation uh, earthquake scientists of all type. It just will be lots of opportunities. Of course, the actual development of the observatory, installation, uh, and, 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 and maintenance, all of this is very important as well. But the richness of, I, I think this will just open up many fronts to the next generation of scientists. Looking at the data will be uh, enormous uh, workforce development, uh, the way I view it. I, I fully agree. It's, it's an amazing opportunity. And one, one of the big strengths, actually, of this, I think. Um, and Frank, did you want to? Yeah, I mean, as following on Yehuda's uh, comments there, I mean, the, I mean, the obvious thing is that this is an opportunity to start integrating multiple types of data that really haven't been put together in many different ways. So, you, so you've so you already defined a big data problem. You start talking some of these things that Jean-Philippe talked about, you're talking huge issues of data management, you talk about the seismic, you talk about the imagery, you talk everything else that we're going to be putting into the INSAR. So you've got from that point alone, but you even go further to think about, okay, how do we teach people how to develop systems that can communicate these sort of things? How do we get the data back? How do we acquire it? How do we learn new levels of instrumentation? I mean, there's all these things that, that, that can be developed into an, a, a workforce or curricular, both for undergraduate level, master's level. Some of these things will propagate out into people that go, may not stay in geophysics or, or sciences, but they may go into other directions. But there's skill sets in here between the, all the computational, the networking, the data acquisition, the data distribution, data analysis. That, that are much broader than what are necessarily obvious from just the hardcore science, which is what you know driving us on this process. Yeah, strong points. Uh, and any other thoughts from the community? We have about uh, two minutes left. Um, obviously, it's a great opportunity for for the next generation. Yeah, but how do we how do we execute? How do we do it well? Yeah, I think, I mean, from, you know, we have a lot of students here that would be really interested in, and like Jamie said, funding for interns is huge, um, you know, and, and I also agree with his comment starting with the undergrad level, and I think at least, you know, my, my students here are always, they love to go out into the field, so to the extent that you can incorporate field trips, either with SCEC meetings or SCEC workshops or whatever, and encourage these students to come along where they have really no commitment you know i mean sometimes the undergrads are hesitant to get involved because they don't feel competent yet you know they don't have that confidence so just being able to tag along to things and see things and and uh you know combining a tectonic geomorphology with these instruments going in you know and stuff like that then you start to attract people that that are more field oriented, people that are more interested in the technology, the seismology. So um, yeah, I mean, that would be, I think, a good way to, to rope in some younger scientists. Awesome points, mate. Yeah, Casey, I, I think we have to wrap up here, right? <laughs> yeah, we do, but I'll just add um, to that uh, one great experience that I personally had uh, with the USRA um, project was they um, had um, graduate level 
focused um, uh, sort of data uh, um, tutorials or you know short courses, I guess they're called. Um, and it was really great for uh, building cohorts across um, institutions. And myself being um, sort of an isolated seismologist on the East Coast, I really appreciated and and still appreciate the friends that I that I um, met through that um, and colleagues. So. I'll just add that. I know we're going to lose people, so I'll go ahead and, and wrap up if that's okay. Um, Perfect, yeah. End our poll, share results, and just share the last screen here. Um, and lower my hand. So thank you, everyone. Um, so thank you, uh, especially to Peter and Frank for organizing, um, Elizabeth, Ellis, and Nate for your presentations, and everyone here um, and who has left uh, for your participation in this session. The recording will be made available on the Iris Earthquake Science playlist on YouTube. If you are interested in future community near-fault observatory breakout sessions and other events, please check out the website in the link provided. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.